Hello and welcome to worship on this Sunday morning. My name is Scott Broman and I am a member here at Faith Covenant Church. I am so thrilled that you are worshiping with us online. If you don't mind, before we start the service, could you either share this uh, through you watching it on Facebook or YouTube because we would really greatly appreciate that. Also, you can go to our website at faithecc.org because we would love to know that you are attending with us online today. You will find a check-in box that we would appreciate you clicking that box. And then once you are there, please let us know any type of prayer requests that you have, anything that we can be praying for for you throughout the week. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Covenant Church. My name is Nate Hickox. I'm the pastor here. I want to welcome you to our worship service in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, it's been a tumultuous and difficult week in our nation, and I imagine that many of us are coming to this Sunday morning in need of peace and security and refreshment and hope and good news. And if that describes where you're at this morning, you've come to the right place. Because our God is a good God. The arms of God are open wide to embrace us and strengthen us this morning. As our call to worship, let me read to you from Psalm 46, verses 1 through 7. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God and the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Friends, even though the, the Bible says, even though nations are in uproar, God is our fortress. He is indeed our fortress. So let's run to him this morning in our worship and in our prayer. And as we eagerly listen to what he has to say to us through his word. So please join me in prayer as we get started. Oh God whose blessed Son came into the world, that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life. Grant that having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. We are so glad to have you worshiping with us today. Wherever you are, uh, however you're doing, we invite you to come into this time and worship our Lord together. So please join us in singing.
And Lord, we pray that whatever we do in this world, we will remember to lead those around us to your love and to show that love to them. Father God, we pray that is what each and every one of us will do this week. Now we pray that you will be with us in this service. You will open our hearts to the words that you have for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning will be read by Gene Austin, and together we'll sing thy word. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 13, verses 8 to 14. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love to one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The word of the Lord. Eliana Tuggy will be bringing us our ministry to children, so let's welcome her by singing, Jesus Loves Me. Today, we are going to play Simon Says. All right. In case any of you don't know the rules to Simon Says, this is how we play. I almost said Simon Smith. <clears throat> Simon Says, this is how you play. If I say, Simon Says, jump, you jump. If I don't say Simon Says before it, you shouldn't do it. So if I just say, jump, no. oops, oops, right? <laughs> you should just stand still. Okay, are we ready to play? Stand up, stand up. Stand up, stand up. Simon says to stand up. Okay. Simon says, jump up and down. Simon says, turn around. Clap your hands. Simon tells you to do because Simon is in charge in this game. Now, if Simon tells you to punch the person next to you, you probably shouldn't do that because God tells us not to do that. And God's laws are more important than anyone else's. We have Simons in real life too. Our parents, um, our teachers, the people that make the laws in this country. They're all in charge of us, so when they tell us what to do, we have to listen to them. We have to follow what they say, even if it doesn't always make sense or we don't always want to. Like at my school, they tell me I have to wear a mask, even when I'm outside. And sometimes that seems annoying to me, and I don't always want to listen because it seems silly but I still have to listen because God put them in charge of me and I want to obey God. When God puts someone in charge of you, it's important to remember that obeying them is part of obeying God. Can I pray for us? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for these boys and girls and thank you for the opportunity um, to talk to them I pray that you would help them to um, have hearts ready to listen to you and ready to obey the people um, that you put in charge of them. Amen. Thank you, Eliana, for that children's sermon. Let's pray together as we open up the word. God, it is our sacred privilege to go to the scriptures and hear a word from you. I, I do pray, Lord, that you would speak through me 
Uh, it's been a difficult week for, me, for our, our world and our nation. God, give me the right words to say. I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts that we might hear. Speak, O oh Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're continuing our sermon series, Anchoring Truth for Turbulent Times. And the title of this morning's sermon is called Anchored No Matter Who is in Authority. And I wrote the title of this sermon uh, almost two months ago. Little did I know that at the time of this recording on Thursday night, we still would have no idea who is in authority in our nation. We don't yet know who our president is going to be. It's been a crazy week. These are crazy times. But I think it helps my case and what I have to say today that I will be nonpartisan in anything I have to say about uh, that topic in the text we're looking at this morning. And I do want to look at the questions, how do we stay anchored when presidents change, when we don't even know who will be in charge, or how do we stay anchored when the person that gets elected is, is someone that we feel is going to end the world as we know it? You know, whatever side. You see, the Apostle Paul, he wrote to a community of Christians in Rome, the heart of the Roman Empire, the most powerful empire perhaps known in human history. And Paul, surprisingly, is going to spend a chunk of verses here encouraging submission to the governing authorities. Now, this may be one of the most difficult passages to read or to preach on in the entire Bible. Uh, entire books have been written on this, uh, but don't worry, we're going to figure it all out in one sermon. Just kidding. But if you've listened to sermons before, you probably know how important context is. Uh, you know, looking at what was going on at the time that the biblical books were written, and that's very important. But also, and at other times, it can be very important to know the context of of the 2,000-year history of biblical interpretation around the passage that we're looking at. And that's especially true with Romans chapter 13 that we're looking at today. Romans chapter 13 may be the most abused and misused biblical passage in the whole Bible. That's a big claim, but let me give you some context to it. Because if you knew that leaders of the Christian church in Nazi Germany, use Romans 13 to justify obedience to Hitler. Reading this passage should give you pause. If you knew that many white people, including those who were in governing authority in South Africa, they use Romans 13 to justify the continuation of apartheid in South Africa, it would give you pause as you read Romans 13. So knowing this history, I want to be very careful in explaining and teaching this biblical passage to you. I'm treading very carefully this morning so that I'm not becoming another person in a long line of, of misuse. I'm going to do my best to give you the best biblical explanation that I can. Scripture can be abused. It can be misused, but in no way does that nullify the Word of God. You know, Satan knows how to quote Scripture. He quoted it to Jesus. He misused it, but what did Jesus do? Jesus quoted Scripture right back to him. So when there are biblical passages that are hard to understand, we have to bring them in conversation with the whole counsel of God, with the whole word of God, so that we can get a more accurate picture. See, Romans 13 by itself is not a complete answer to how Christians are to relate to the governing authorities. Uh, one biblical scholar, Leon Morris, he says this, Paul does not face, let alone resolve, the problem of when it is right to rebel against unjust tyranny, or what to do when there are rival claimants to the crown, or when there are conflicts between civil and religious authorities. He does not distinguish between legitimate and usurped authority. He does not go into the question of when a successful rebel may have be held to have become the legitimate ruler. There are a lot of situations that could happen that Paul does not address at all in our text. So if this passage can so easily be misused, and if it's not meant to be a complete summary of a theology of church and state, then why is it here in the book of Romans in the first place? It's a good question, right? Now, here's a clue that I want to give you for biblical inter interpretation. 
when you come across encouragements and commands in the Bible, they're typically there because people are tempted to break them or are currently breaking them. They're there to reinforce a standard that is in danger of being uh, uh, broken. And so it seems that there were a, a group of Christians in the early church in Rome who were tempted to or were rebelling against uh, the governing authorities, or maybe even attempting to overthrow them. And so we need to look at the context now of Romans 13 to understand why Paul is bringing this up in this letter. So let's talk about setting the context. I'll put one point here. We need to remember that Jesus' kingdom was and is a subversive political entity. It was a subversive political entity. If you remember, Caesar Augustus, he had said that he had brought justice and peace to the world. And he had started by saying that his adoptive father, Julius Caesar, was divine, and therefore Augustus was the son of God. And people started calling Caesar, Augustus, king, lord, and the savior of the whole world. And Caesar said that he had brought good news. He had brought the gospel of peace to the entire world. So when Paul opens up the book of Romans, and he says that Jesus has brought the gospel of peace to the entire world, and he is the Lord and the Savior. This is very subversive. To say all this, to say that Jesus is Lord, is to mean that Caesar is not. To say that Jesus is the Son of God is to say that Caesar is not. To say that Jesus brings the gospel means that Caesar does not. In fact, in the book of Acts, when Paul and Silas got in trouble, uh, the authorities said, these men have caused trouble all over the world. They have now come here. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. See, Jesus and his movement were seen as a threat. That's why he was killed. He was saying he's a new king, a new movement, a new people, a new political reality of how we organize people in the world. So we take that into consider in consideration and then remember that Paul had just said some things in Romans 12 about not being conformed to this world. So there is a real te temptation for Christians to say, hey, we're, we're a different kingdom. We're, we're not to be conformed to this world. Therefore, we should be exempt from the governing authorities or we should be exempt from paying taxes to these pagan rulers. So Paul is speaking into that context. A second thing that we need to remember about the context here is that violent revolution was a real option. It was a real option at this time in the first century. You see, many Jewish people in general, they did not support serving a foreign king or paying taxes to a pagan government. government. And at this time, heavy taxation, Roman records show, this was becoming an increasing burden that was so irksome to the people at this time. And there was a political movement in the first century uh, that wanted to violently overthrow Roman rule, and we know them as the Zealots. And that may ring a bell for you because one of the twelve apostles was known as Simon the Zealot. At one point, he was a part of this movement to violently overthrow the Roman government. I mean, you can imagine having a government that uh, has heavily increased your taxes to an incredible burden. It persecutes your religion. The leader claims to be God, and they use their force to keep you in submission all the time. I mean, how would you feel about that? And there are a group of Jews who believe that it would be better to bear arms and to overthrow this government. And that is a real temptation for people in the churches in the first century A.D., and time and time again, as we look at Christian history, we know that Christians have been tricked into taking up arms and killing other people for the sake of a political movement or goal. So Paul is addressing this temptation and this mindset. So we need to remember that Romans 13 is connected to Romans 12. You know, the chapter divisions in the Bible, they are not original. And sometimes the divisions, they are very unfortunate because they disconnect passages that are meant to be connected. Because Paul, if you remember from last week, Paul had just laid out this beautiful vision of what it means to live in the kingdom of God. In a world that makes enemies, we're meant to make peace. In a world that's doing evil, we are meant to do good. And so that's our political strategy 
That's our strategy in this broken world. So with that in mind, Paul finally says what he's going to say in Romans 13. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And this is a strong statement by the Apostle Paul. And even though these verses have been misused and abused, there is good biblical truth here. God has established authority in principle to exist in the world. And in a world of sin and injustice, this is a really good thing. Uh, Because even if we live in a society that despises the authorities, when a horrible murder or robbery or injustice happens, we hope to see a good government do something about it and give justice to the victims. See, we know that anarchy would be chaos for this world. So at the very least, we can say that God has established authority and government in the world for the good of the world and for the restraining of evil. And God is always at work. He's working for good in spite of the sinful human beings that are in charge in the world. And so God can, and he does, bring good out of sinful governments. We can affirm that. But we might be asked ask the question, well, what about the individual leaders in charge? You know, this passage and other passages in the Bible seem to affirm that God is at work raising up kings and leaders and deposing other kings and leaders. For example, God uses the evil king Nebuchadnezzar to accomplish one of his purposes, and Cyrus of Persia as well. But knowing the history of this passage, we need to be very careful about saying that God has appointed so-and-so to be our leader. Now, God may allow, and he may be specifically appointing this person to be in charge for a purpose that only he knows, not us. But that certainly does not mean that he approves of that leader, that he approves of what they do, or that we have to obey them because God put them in charge. See, that can get destructive really, really quickly. So in summary, we can say that God has established authority and government for our good, and he is at work mysteriously through those governing authorities. So I hope I have done what I need to do to clear away some of the thorns from this passage so that we can actually look at it to help us learn, well, how can it apply to us and help, how can it help us stay anchored no matter who is in authority in the world? And in the Roman Empire, Paul encourages the early church to do three things to which I will add a fourth as we look at the whole context of Scripture. So how, how can we stay anchored? Number one, we overcome evil with good, but we be submissive. Overcome evil with good, but be submissive. Remember, Romans 12 comes first. It's connected. We overcome evil with good while submitting to those governing authorities. So we need to get it out of our minds that Romans 13 is just about being passive and sitting around and and letting the world just go on until Jesus returns. No, we are called to work at overcoming evil uh, uh, with good while rejecting the way of rebellion and violence. I mean, this is what Jesus did, right? With his words and his actions, he worked towards justice. He overcame evil with good. He opposed both the religious and the secular uh, rulers of his day. But ultimately, he submitted to being judged by them and punished by them. And through that submission and his death on the cross, he won the greatest victory. Their evil actions of killing Jesus is the very thing that led to the salvation of of the whole world. And that's what we do. We work towards justice. We overcome evil with good. We preach the gospel, and we accept the consequences of those actions. So the answer to the governing authorities is not to violently overthrow, but to overcome evil with good. And I think a good example of this from another portion of the Bible from a different time period is when God's people were sent to exile in Babylon. And you'll remember this context, hopefully, from our previous series, if you tuned in for our From Ruins to Restoration series. Because in exile, the people were in Babylon under a pagan king, a foreign government, an evil king at that. And God gives them some counsel for what to do that can also help us. 
Look what it says in Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord Almighty says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they, they too may have sons and daughters. Increase the number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it pro prospers, you too will prosper. So Craig Keener, biblical scholar, sums this up by saying, God expects his people to live in the societies where he has placed them. And Babylon is a good example. Uh, it's a wicked, it's a sinful, it's an evil regime that God is still using for his purposes. And the people of God find, the, find themselves living under this authority. And they are told not to rebel, even though some wanted to rebel and fight against Babylon in the, in the beginning. But no, God says, just settle down. Seek the good of Babylon. Seek peace and shalom and, and pray for Babylon. Because if it prospers, you will prosper as well. So in a world that makes enemies, we keep making peace. You see, violent revolution and overthrow is not the way of Jesus Christ. So we submit to the authorities over us where God has placed us, all the while pursuing peace, building houses, raising families, planting gardens, overcoming evil with all kinds of good. And as the church of Jesus Christ, how much does our world need us to be a positive force for good? I saw online someone qu quoting that, a divided nation needs a united church. And we need this, our, our world, our Babylon, our America, needs a united church to be the light, to bring peace, and to pray. We are united by our mission to be the light and love of Jesus Christ and to overcome evil with good in all the places where we live. So that way, we are, that way when we do this, we are anchored no matter who is in authority or what's going on in our world. The second thing that Paul encourages the people to do is to avoid punishment, do what is right, and pay your taxes. Avoid punishment, do what is right, pay your taxes. Romans 13, 3 through 5. In fact, I'm going to go back to the screen because I have it on here for you. Paul continues, Rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Notice the right and wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servant, uh, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. So, Paul again, is not laying out an entire theology of church and state. But in general, he seems to be saying the purpose of government is to encourage people to do what is good and right, what's morally good, and to punish and restrain what's morally wrong in the world. And because of that, they have real authority to do that, to enforce that and, and commend the good and punish the wrong. And so Paul is warning the early church who wants to rebel and withdraw from this, these governing authorities. So to those in the early church who are planning revolt, to, to those who are planning to use violence, to those who are withholding the taxes from the tax collectors, to those who are rejecting the government's authority as a matter of principle, Paul says, watch out. God has instituted authority and they have the right to bear the sword. And so if you disobey, you're going to face punishment. And we're called to obey the moral laws. So God has established all of this, so be submissive so that you avoid punishment, but also out of reverence for the God who has established this all for his mysterious purposes. So this is why Paul continues in verse 6. He says, this is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So, to a secular, heathen, sinful, pagan government, Paul says, pay your taxes. Because even if those leaders don't acknowledge it at all, God is working out his purposes behind the scenes to reward the good and punish evil. But we all know a question gnaws at us about this text. What do we do 
when government does the opposite of what it's supposed to do. You know, Paul is saying it's, it's supposed to commend the good and punish the bad. But what happens when it punishes the good and rewards the bad, as so often has happened throughout history? That brings me to point number three. Friends, we are to obey God rather than sinful laws. We are to obey God above all sinful laws, always, all the time. When Peter and the apostles were told not to preach the gospel, in Acts 5, 29, they say, they say we must obey God rather than people. And that is good political theology for us. Because quite often, governments enact and promote sinful policies, sinful laws, unjust things. You know, our church has been in this Bible reading plan, and we've been reading through the book of First and Second Kings. The northern nation of Israel had 20 kings. How many of them were good? Not one. All 20 were considered by the Bible to be evil kings. The nation of Judah, where the holy temple was, was located in Jerusalem, out of their 20 kings, only eight received a positive rating. And, all, and many of those, the text says, allowed things or did things that were contrary to the will of God. So we have a record of consistently evil and bad leadership. Even from the kings of God's people, not to mention the kings of Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Rome, the Caesars of Rome, and all of the leaders throughout human history. So, as followers of Jesus, as citizens of heaven, we are always going to have tension, if not significant tension, with the governments and kingdoms of this world. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So we need to be very discerning about obeying God, always obeying God, rather than sinful laws. And so I want to remind you, just because something is legal, that doesn't make it right. And just because something is illegal, that doesn't make it wrong. God determines those things. So although the Bible tells us very clearly, submit to governing authorities, it's also filled with examples of people who are obeying God and his word and disobeying those very same authorities. I want to give you multiple examples. For example, the prime example, the apostle Paul himself, the very one who wrote these very clear words about submitting to the governing authorities, it's the very one who was constantly disobeying those authorities. I mean, how many times was he writing from prison and flogged and beaten and all of these things because he was disobeying government orders and laws to stop preaching about Jesus Christ? But he wouldn't do it. Peter and John and the rest of the early church, they also disobeyed those same orders. We can go to the Old Testament. We learned about the Hebrew midwives the king of Egypt had said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Moses, so that's one example. Another example, Moses, he tells the supreme leader of the land, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. What does Moses do? Does he, does he listen? No. He leads a freedom march out into the wilderness to bring freedom to the people of God. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they are told to bow down to the idol from King Nebuchadnezzar that had made. And they say to him, Your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Daniel, when they had made an order to, only, to not pray to anybody else besides the king of Persia, uh, or Babylon, it says, when Daniel learned that the, that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before, even though it was against the law. And Esther, when she needed to save the people of God, she says, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I'm going to disobey the governing authorities, and whatever happens, happens. I will submit to the outcome of that. Biblical scholar John Stott says, whenever laws are enacted which contradict God's law, civil disobedience becomes a Christian duty. And one of the modern-day examples of, the people, uh, of people who lived out this conviction and stood up against unjust laws was the Christian pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and he says basically the same thing John Stott says, but he says, 
There are two types of laws, just and unjust. I will be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And we know from Martin Luther King's life, what a difference he made for many people by disobeying unjust laws through his Christian conviction as a Christian pastor. So Paul, at the end of this passage in Romans 13, he reminds the Christians what's most important. So look what Paul says in Romans 13, 9 through 10. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You see, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, these are the most supreme laws in God's entire universe. These must supersede any law of the land or of any state. And Jesus told us, taught in the parable of the Good Samaritan, that the care for our neighbor should extend to great lengths to anybody that might be hurt or in need or needs our help and mercy. So anyone we might encounter. You know, when Hitler's Germany outlawed helping and saving the Jews, some Christians like Corey Ten Boom, they, they broke the law to hide them and save them in their houses. And that was the right thing to do, obviously. Now, God forbid we would ever have to face an extreme situation like that, but we need to be prepared. And we should even be asking ourselves now, are there, are there unjust laws that might encourage me to do something that's wrong? You know, how do we love our neighbor that the state calls illegal? How do we love our neighbor that the state calls a criminal or for whom the state does not grant asylum or rights? You know, what does it mean to love our neighbor who is beaten up on the side of the road, perhaps beaten up by the authorities themselves? What do we do in these situations? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor with the same concern and love that you'd want for yourself. We must be ready to love our neighbor as we would want to be loved and remind ourselves that we are accountable to Jesus Christ, the supreme king and lord of the whole world. We're accountable to him over any laws of the land. And finally, Paul says one more thing in this passage. He essentially says, remember, the time is short, so repent and follow Jesus Christ. The time is short. And verse 11 of Romans 13 says, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer, is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So friends, ever since Jesus Christ came, we've been in the last days. And certainly we are nearer to his return than we were, than, than the Apostle Paul was when he wrote those words. And our salvation, our eternal life in Jesus, that's the only thing that's going to last forever. So this life and all the kingdoms of the world that exist, they are not going to last the reality is we look at human history, kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. You know, where is the mighty Roman Empire now? Where is Caesar now? In fact, I had a seminary professor named Dr. Price who said, Jesus is still king, but Caesar's just a salad. <laughs> I love that phrase. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall, but Jesus' kingdom will always advance. So no matter what happens politically, no matter who wins the election this week, I don't, I don't even know yet, no matter who is in power in the world, God's kingdom is always advancing, and Jesus is always still on the one throne that truly matters. And friends, he is coming soon to fix this broken world. And while we await that day, perhaps with more eagerness now than we've ever had before, what we do is we need to adopt a posture of submissiveness to the authorities around us, we pay our taxes. We seek the place of where we live. We overcome evil with good. We obey God rather than sinful laws. And we pursue following Jesus, our one true king. And when we do that, we will be anchored no matter who is in authority. So friends, let's put away the deeds of darkness. Let's repent and follow Jesus Christ. He is our only hope. He is the savior of the whole world. And in Jesus Christ, we will be anchored now and through all eternity.
Would you pray with me this morning? Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are our anchor. No matter what happens in our world, you are still on the throne. You are still our king. And Lord, it has been a difficult and tumultuous week with a lot of stress or anxiety and worry about what's going to happen in our nation, in our world. And we're just asking that you would help us and comfort us, unite your church in our nation and around the world. Let us be the light that you call us to be. God, we confess that as a church that we have allowed the divisions of this world and the the divisions of our nation to divide the body of Christ even. So Lord, forgive us for that. Let us be unified, Lord, about, uh, around the mission you have called us to have in this broken world. We pray for the healing of this country. We pray for our sad divisions to cease. We pray that you would use your church to be a healing balm, a, a community of people that is a different party altogether, neither, neither right nor left, but the kingdom of God that brings your healing and gospel to this world. Let us be your people of peace. Thank you, God, for the wonderful privilege that we have uh, in that. And God, we pray that our church, Faith Covenant Church, would be involved in whatever way you call us. Let us be open and discerning to the ways that we can be the light. We thank you for the good things going on here, Lord, as we continue this construction project at our church. We pray that it would all come together, give wisdom to our contractor, to our workers, to all those who are working on this project. We pray that it would continue to go well and glorify your holy name. God, we want to lift up all those in our church who are dealing with various issues and needs. We're praying for Meg Cockle's recovery from surgery, for Sally Hutchinson's recovery from surgery, for Dottie Hookstra as she goes through cancer. Lord, we pray your healing touch upon these beloved sisters. God, heal them and comfort them and strengthen them. We also pray for Janie and Timo uh, and their new babies. We pray that you would watch over their little ones, continue to help them grow and to be healthy, and give them, Lord, the comfort of your touch as well. And Lord, we want to pray for all those who are feeling isolated, alone, depressed, struggling with their mental health. Oh God, I pray that you would lift them out of the fog, I pray that you would give them the courage to reach out if they need to. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to know that they're not alone. I pray that you would help them to sense your presence and your peace through this time. Father, we thank you that you're so good. Thank you that you are our anchor through every storm. Be the center of our lives and our hearts and of our church. And now let's pray out loud together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. By saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We want to take a moment in our service to dedicate all the tithes and offerings that were given during this past week. So let's bless them by singing the doxology. back to you. And it is our privilege to give so that we might uh, use these tithes and offerings to do the work of the kingdom. Father God, we pray that you will take all these gifts and you will bless them and multiply them so that your work will be done in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we close out our service today, uh, we're going to sing a song that really speaks to what Pastor Nate preached on and how it doesn't matter who's in authority. What matters is that Christ is the center of our lives and that uh, he is the one in which we put our trust. So as we close out our service, let's sing this song together. And when we put Christ at the center of our lives, we are then going to be ready to do the work that God has in this world for us. And that's the true work of spreading the light and love of God's glorious kingdom, the only kingdom that matters. And so we're going to close our service today by singing this great hymn, We Have a Story to Tell to the Nations. i 
Thank you again for worshiping with us on this great Sunday. Uh, just one announcement I want to leave with you before uh, we go about our day is that mark on your calendars, November 26th at 9 a.m. here at Faith Covenant Church, we are going to have our Thanksgiving hike and hymn sing. We are going to do this rain or shine. We will be outside the entire time. So please come join us for that wonderful day to start off Thanksgiving on a great note. Thank you again and have a wonderful week. Brothers and sisters, thanks for joining us in worship today. I hope you were encouraged. I hope you were uplifted. And I hope you were anchored in Jesus Christ. Receive the benediction as you go this morning. May the love of our Heavenly Father draw you ever closer to Him. May the grace and peace of Jesus Christ guide you on the journey. May the power of the Holy Spirit send you now to go be the church and make disciples. Amen. you yeah.